in this guide, you have a story bearing form that is related to the position of the target. So you can put your name and pseudonym on this system. Your ball.
Literally amazing. You can't hear me? Monitor way down. Monitor down. Monitor. If only we hadn't spent that money that we had for monitor down. One, two, three. Down, lower, lower, lower. That's that. That's good, that's good. If only they hadn't spent that money their mothers gave them on a sound booth training for ice cream. We'd be in, we'd be in a lot better shape. So, okay? Just because hardly anybody showed up, we gotta give them the best we can, you know? How are you doing? Good? Everybody's staying away from the COVID stuff or the Omicron? Seems like every time I pick up my phone, somebody else, either here or far away, relatives, et cetera, are coming down with this thing. It's, uh, it's sad. <clears throat> and everybody keeps telling me, I can't wait till this goes away. <laughs> like polio went away and uh, all the other childhood diseases went away and the, the flu that we get every year went away. I got a feeling we're going to have to all buck up and learn how to deal. Uh, get your shots and take care of yourself and stay out of harm's way. Um, Bob Brooks had it. Um, Jerry Falk, Steve's here. Jerry Falk has had it. Um, uh, who else? Let me think. Um, uh, Sam and Lynn had it. So quite, how many of you know somebody that's had this Omicron? Yeah, yeah. almost everybody, almost everybody. So <clears throat> I'd like to ask you to say a prayer today uh, um, up in the uh, Ocala version of uh, the, the uh, hospital, Advent hosp Health Hospital, uh, is our dear friend Diane Dresbach. And uh, she has a bowel blockage, and they're trying to decide how exactly how to handle that. There was a possibility she might have surgery today, and I didn't, I didn't hear anything this morning. But I was up with her yesterday afternoon, and uh, in a lot of discomfort. And um, her, her good buddy Sandy's with her, and so is uh, her, her cousin, uh, Chris. And um, very, very uncomfortable. So if you could, please remember to say a prayer for Diane. She's just a really special person. A uh, couple of quick announcements as we get started today. Uh, we have um, a movie coming up on the 21st, which I believe is this Friday night, and uh, it's, got, it's, it's about puppy dogs, but it's got Betty White in it, so I thought that would be a good one to pick for this time. So uh, uh, come out. It's, it's entertaining and fun, and I think you'll, you'll have a good time. Just like now, we'll be social distanced. Uh, we ask that you wear a mask if you would, please, but uh, we don't require it. Um, also, uh, we have a couple of concerts that are in the works. Uh, Kevin's got one coming for us on uh, February the 13th, which is Valentine's weekend. And uh, to me, it's going to be like what we did on uh, Christmas, prior to Christmas. We've got uh, Kevin's trio. We've got Billy. We've got Pinky, uh, Ben Simmons, and uh, Bob Stamen. Uh, are going to be here. Um, uh, Nancy Scharf 
And some of you will remember Nancy. She's the music director of a big Lutheran church up in northern Jersey and goes around, does concerts, particularly in the summertime. She, the, down along the Jersey Shore, she does, uh, she does concerts. <clears throat> and uh, she's sung for us before. She'll be here that week, uh, that week doing concerts for Hope Lutheran at the various Hope Lutheran sites. And uh, she'll be with us on the 13th in the morning and then again, uh, she'll be part of that concert on, uh, on, in the evening. It's $20, and it's uh, to benefit the infant toddler pantry. So if you're, uh, if you're available, the tickets are uh, going to be on sale starting uh, today out there in the narthex. Also, we had a really wonderful breakfast on um, last Wednesday with um, <clears throat> a representative from the uh, uh, Cornerstone Hospice. And the uh, young lady did a spectacular job, answered a lot of questions people had about hospice ministry. And um, we were able to present on your behalf a check for about a little over $1,100 uh, to Hospice Foundation. And they were most grateful for that. And by the way, I don't, you know, somehow or another, I never mentioned this in church. I mentioned it individually, and I think it's in, the, it's in our newsletter this week that's going to go out. Uh, but a couple weeks ago, you all remember the uh, tornado episode that went through the center part of the country and uh, just literally devastated towns and communities and killed uh, about 100 people and injured a lot more. Uh, we, the, your board of trustees met, and we had mission money available that was undesignated, so uh, we were able to send a check for $10,000 to uh, the Salvation Army and uh, the uh, Samaritan's Purse <clears throat> to uh, try to help out with that through, through the National Association of our church. So I, I know you weren't aware that we did that, but we did. So, um, so that's between that and what we did for hospice and so on. Uh, even in this awful time of empty seats and pandemic and rainstorms, we're still doing our thing to do God's work in this place, which is an exciting thing, continues to be an exciting thing. Uh, Holy Communion, the next Holy Communion is Sunday, February the 6th, and I hope that you'll come and, and be with us. Don't forget the annual meeting, uh, which will take place uh, two weeks from today uh, after the morning worship service, and next week on the 23rd, uh, you can pick up your copy of the uh, annual report. <clears throat> Got some kind of a allergy this morning. Um, and then uh, coming up on um, coming up in February the 9th, February the 9th will be our next mission breakfast, and uh, that one is going to be, I think, uh, Reverend uh, David Hauk from the Camp Sozo. If he's not able to come, some representative will be here to, uh, to share the ministry of the uh, to the far national forest up there so uh, the tickets for that are also available it's five bucks and the only reason we sell tickets for it is because we know if we don't sell tickets people say they're going to come if they sign up they say they're going to come and they don't and then we're stuck with food expenses and so on so it's better to charge a nominal amount and uh, you get a full big breakfast i think we charged five dollars the last time and we had hash browns and scrambled eggs and pancakes and pancakes sausage. It was a good breakfast, wasn't it? And, um, and we had a wonderful program. So it's uh, worth your while to come. These are sponsored by the mission board. So uh, encourage you to come out and join us for that. Um, this, this month's mission is Cornerstone Hospice, by the way, and that ends in two weeks. The flowers on the altar this morning uh, are there, uh, given by the uh, Tomberlins, Roland and Barbara. And uh, this, this is just kind of beyond my comprehension. Roland and Barbara have been married for 69 years. Wow. Well, that's <laughs> Congratulations. That's amazing. My wife Dawn has nightmares at night that we might be someday married 69 years. <laughs> no. So, wow, isn't that amazing? That is just wonderful. That's just wonderful. Either, either Roland is just some wonderful special guy or Barbara has got the most patience of any woman on the planet. I don't know. Maybe both, maybe both. 
working on You're working on it. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to keep at it till you get it right, huh? Good for you. Good for you. Well, we're proud of you. That's, that's amazing. And the, the flowers on the altar are there for, for their anniversary. Uh, our, we are having Martin Luther King uh, Sunday today. We recognize uh, his good work and uh, his uh, contribution to our culture and society. And um, he, of course, was uh, not only a civil rights leader, but he was a pastor of a church and uh, uh, spoke uh, the gospel. And in addition to the political side of it, there was also the the spiritual side of his ministry and time uh, with us and uh, taken from us way too young. But we will have uh, we'll, our whole service centers around uh, his life and ministry and our appreciation for uh, for what he did. And so, uh, probably nobody does songs that I really like uh, related to the civil rights movement of Martin Luther King, uh, like our good friend the Skipper. So we asked if he would come, and he said he would. And uh, the, the very, very favorite song he, he sings is, for me is Abraham, Martin, and John. He's going to do that one. And there's another one a little later on uh, that he's going to do. And uh, you, may, you may or may not have heard it. It is, I will sing for you, uh, dear Martin Luther King. And it's uh, something that Harry Belafonte did in a TV production uh, way, way back when. And... Uh, Listen to the words. It's just a phenomenal song. So we want to worship the Lord together, and we're going to begin with Kevin and his prelude.
morning. Okay. This is a song. Oh, wait, 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 Kev. This is a song that um, I've sung several times at the Martin Luther King breakfast that, of course, we haven't had for the last two years. The first year that I went to the breakfast, the words to this song were in the program. No, they weren't. They weren't in the program, but they sang it. And all the black people sang and all the white people sat there. So I said to someone, you need to put the words in the program. And the following year they did. And then everybody sang it. And we've all sung it ever since. And that's the way it should be. So it's a wonderful song and, and I want you to listen to the lyrics because it's a really a great song. Hey, by, now you can play. By, no, not yet. Oh, not yet. By the way, this is oft times called the Negro National Anthem That's or right. African American National That's Anthem right. now. So it's a very important song to black folks. And uh, uh, like I, again, the words are good. <laughs> okay, Kevin, now you can come over to this piano. All right, here we go. That's a segue talk. <laughs> Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven and ring Ring with the harmonies Of liberty Let our rejoicing rise High as the listening skies Let it resound loud as the rolling sea song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun. Let us march on till victory is won. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, fell in the days when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have not our weary feet come to the place for which our Father sighed. We over a way that with tears has been watered we have come treading our path through the blood of the slaughtered out from the gloomy past till now we stand at last where the white gleam of our bright star is cast god of our weary silent tears thou who has brought us thus far on our way thou who has by thy might led us into the light keep us forever on this path we pray lest our feet stray from the places our God where we met thee our hearts drunk with the wine of the world we forget thee shadowed beneath thy hand may we forever stand true to our God true to our native land This is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We worship him together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Come, all of you who long for light. Come, all of you who want your joy increased. Come, all of you who are carrying heavy burdens. Come all who need a savior. 
seeking a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, the Prince of Peace. Come, let us worship the Lord. age of 56, John Kennedy was 46, Martin Luther King 39, and Bobby Kennedy 42, and that's what this song is about. Skipper. Let's pray together. Gracious Lord, come near to us as we come near to you. In this time of worship, speak to us once more your invitation to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with you. 
Awaken our sleeping hearts until they are aligned with your heart. Stir our minds so that they may seek a fuller knowledge of you. Push us from this place so that we might follow as faithfully as possible, working hard to see justice roll down in our community, in our city, in our nation, and around the world. Amen. Now, Billy's going to come and we're going to have her sing, uh, Jesus Loves the Little Children. I think we have words for them to sing, too. Yeah, and the reason we do this one on Martin Luther King Day is, if you recall that great I Have a Dream speech, he references his own children, and he references the day when all the children will sit down together and uh, racism will be no more. So uh, I think that that dream is in King's heart because it ought to be in our heart because it was in the Lord's heart. Jesus loves the little children. Oh, good, there's slides. <laughs> Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus died for all the children all the children of the world red and yellow black and white they are precious in his sight jesus died for all the children in the world we must pray for all the children all the children of the world red and yellow black and white they are precious in his sight. We must pray for all the children of the world. We must help the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. We must help the little children of the world. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart. Confess our sins and the God our Father. Beseech of him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grant us forgiveness. desires for us to be whole. In an effort for us to repeat being well, God is always taking what has happened and putting the darkest corners of our lives at our path and lifting it up to the light. God can heal and can do the worst of our experiences and the most destructive events of our history. God is ready to do all things new. Sometimes I feel No, that's not what's on the screen. Huh? That's not what's on the screen. That's uh, the last hymn. So no. That's the first verse. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain. Sometimes I feel discouraged 
and think my work's in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. If you cannot preach like Peter, if you cannot pray like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus and say he died for all. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a bomb in Gilead to heal the sin-sick soul. Heavenly Father, once in a great while, seemingly scattered so far apart, you send to us someone who challenges us, who lifts up the right things that we ought to be doing, who calls us to take whatever actions are necessary to bring all of your people together. And so often we reject them. Sometimes we kill them. And Martin Luther King was that kind of clarion call from you. Oh, he was not perfect, and the bigots of our world will dig through his life and try to find those things which they claim are wrong about him or misguided about him. But we read our Bible unlike those people. And we read in that Bible that Moses was flawed, Jacob was flawed, Isaiah was flawed, the disciples were flawed. And to reject them all is to reject our faith. So we see in this man who died from an assassin's bullet at the age of 39, we see in him goodness, we see in him hope. We see in him a call to his people and to all people to come together, to live in love, to live in peace, to reject violence. And to reject him is to reject those things. So we ask you, Heavenly Father, on this weekend in which he is remembered, that we remember what he tried to get us to see. We remember the need, even in this day, to break down the walls and the barriers, to destroy the, the colors that separate us, to make us whole again. Father, there are so many who are held back, so many who are hurting. We see children come to our pantry, Father. They're Hispanic. Their parents can barely speak English. They are black, and they are living in poverty. Every now and then, they're living in their car. And we know that in each of those children is possibility, maybe one of them. And I think this so often, Father, maybe one of them has the cure to cancer. Maybe one of them can help us to throw away the bombs and the armaments and the hatred and the anger and bring us to peace and harmony and love again. Maybe one of those children 
is your Martin Luther King Jr., is your Peter or your Paul for our generation. Let us not reject them. Let us not judge them. Let us not push them aside. Let us help them. Let us care for them. If in the process we help those who take advantage or don't need us, so be it. There is no failure or sin in that. And one day we'll be in your presence and you'll be rewarding us for caring. But if we reject them and we push them aside, one day we'll be in your presence and you'll ask us why. Today on Martin Luther King Day, Sunday, we ask that we might recommit ourselves, or if we've never done so, commit ourselves for the first time, to the cause of justice and peace and harmony, recommit ourselves to take the, the resource and the blessing that is ours and share it with those who do not have, to not worry about how it gets spent or to not worry about whether or not we agree with this aspect of the politics of it or not, but to just care, to just love, for that's what you've called us to do. Sometimes it costs us. Sometimes it costs us dearly. It cost Martin Luther King his life. So we ask you, Father, awaken your nation, awaken your world, awaken your people to bring peace and love and harmony and equality and justice for all. For we ask these things in the name of your Son, our Lord, our Savior, our Master, our friend, that Jewish carpenter from Galilee, who taught us to say when we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This time we are going to call upon the ushers to receive your morning tithes and offerings. Heavenly Father, you have called us through your son's teaching to reach out, to heal the sick, 
to care for the poor, to do whatever is possible to make life better for young and old alike. And so now to your throne of grace, we bring these our gifts to do those very things. We ask you to bless them, multiply them, use them to honor him. For we pray these things in his name and for his sake. Amen. <clears throat> beautiful song, I Sing For You, Sweet Martin Luther King, was written by Jake Holmes for Mr. Harry Belafonte. And last year when I wanted to sing it for you, uh, I mentioned it to your musical director, to Kevin. He said, well, show me the sheet music. I said, there is no sheet music. Mr. Belafonte sang it in two television specials. And we can hear it on YouTube, but... Uh, the, he didn't even have a chance to make a, a recording of it, an album, with this song on it. But the words cover so much of what Dr. King meant to Mr. Belafonte, who marched with him on many, many occasions and uh, helped to further the civil rights movement that um, I think these words are so, so important. Um, Mr. Belafonte is still alive. I had a chance to meet him twice uh, earlier uh, in his life. And uh, uh, I know that he's a very kind um, and gentle man. And um, I sing this for Dr. King and for Mr. Belafonte. <laughs> could feel better but no better than the smallest of the small he showed me victories where no one loses showed me the answer for us all in the song that I sing, I sing for you, sweet Martin Luther King, In the song I sing, I sing for you, sweet Martin Luther King. People gathered round him Open arms, the only weapons that they bore He wove us into cloth of many colors Now with love, he marched us off to war song I sing Sing for you, sweet Martin Luther King. And the song I sing, I sing for you, sweet Martin Luther King. The more he spoke of love, 
the more they feared him. The more he spoke the truth, their lies would grow. Suddenly, with no goodbyes, we lost him. Our sweet black prince of peace, we miss you so. thinking they would not flower. But he planted seeds everywhere he'd gone. So that someday in an endless field of colors, a million dreams would bloom to carry on. And a song I sing to you, sweet Martin Luther King, and the song I sing, I sing to you, sweet Martin Luther King. Try with me, and the song, and the song. Martin Luther King last time and the song I sing I sing to you sweet Martin Luther that Kevin put together with no sheet music or anything. Thank you, Skipper. The scripture lesson this morning was supposed to be read by Bob Brooks, but Bob came down with uh, the COVID uh, Omicron, and um, he is doing a little better, but he's decided to hold back on coming to church for a while again until he gets his strength back. So uh, <clears throat> say a prayer for Bob and for Carol, and uh, the scripture will be read by me. Luke chapter 2, verses 41 through 52. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day, and then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they didn't find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts sitting among the teachers and listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to, his, to her son, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. What? Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? And they didn't understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them. He was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God, and in favor with man. Perhaps one of the most important verses in the New Testament is this 52nd verse of the second chapter of Luke. 
I'll read it to you again. And Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God, and in favor with man. This is a, a picture of a complete person. This is the scripture giving us a, an idea of, of what we are to work on being better at in our life. He grew in wisdom intellectually. He grew in stature physically. He grew in favor with God spiritually. And he grew in favor with man socially. Let us all be like Jesus. We have another song from the skipper. And it, this was Martin Luther King's, if not his favorite, one of his very favorite hymns. And uh, it was the one he, he asked for off of the balcony just before he was assassinated. Precious Lord, take my hand. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I'm so tired and I'm weak, like some and I am worn. University through the storm, through the night, lead me on in the light. And take my hand, precious Lord, lead me Lexington home. Writes later in his 90s, Dr. James. When Lockley. my way grows drear, precious Lord, linger near. When my life, when my life is almost gone. Hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand, lest I fall, take my hand, precious Lord, take me home. When the darkness appears in the light, draws near in the day the day is past and gone at the river I stand at my feet hold my hand take my hand precious Lord lead me on Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me stand. I am so tired, and I am weak, and I am worn. Through the storm, through the night, lead me on to the light. Take my hand, precious Lord, lead me home. The words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O God. I guess it depends where you grew up. Depends on your economic status. Depends on the parents who raised you. How much of an understanding you have of how tough it is for people of color. And I think you can also link into that people of other ethnic backgrounds and 
those who have grown up in other cultures within our culture. This is a, a day in which we ought to remember, we ought to celebrate, we ought to recommit on behalf of not just the African American community, not just what Martin Luther King stood for and fought for, but something that goes far beyond that. I remember when my dad came back from World War II and we lived on this little street, Cedar Street, in downtown Reading, Pennsylvania. There was no money, and if you lived through that generation or your parents were that generation, you know that when these guys came back, they got very little support and help, and many of them took off and went to war without the kind of educational background that would serve them well when they got home. So it was tough, and it was hard for them. So, so many of them learned very quickly when they got back here that after the parades were over and the uh, congratulatory uh, family gatherings were done, they had to go to work, and they had to suffer through not having the tools that they needed to succeed. Well, we were that kind of family, and so this little Cedar Street that we grew up on was not wide enough for two cars to pass without one car going up on the sidewalk. It was in the hood. <laughs> the guy who lived next door to us, Mr. Schlegel, was a, well, now you'd call him a recycling expert. <laughs> he had a barn behind his house, behind the row homes that we lived in, and in that barn he kept an old horse and a little wagon, and he would go down through the town of Reading, and he would holler out, and he was Pennsylvania Dutch background, so he had a Dutch, a Dutch accent, and he would yell, Rex, papers, Rex, papers, and people would stop him, and they would bring out newspapers and bundles that they had tied together with a a string or a ribbon or whatever and rags in a bag and he would throw them in the wagon and he'd take them uh, to a place where they would give him pennies on the, for 100 pounds of, uh, of refuge, really. It was not a great neighborhood. Across the street from us, there was an African-American family and that African-American family, the, the dad worked for the police department in Reading. He was one of the first black officers in Reading. And they had a little son who was born almost the same week I was born, same age as I was. His name was Bonzi. And Bonzi and I were the best of friends, and we played together. I would be at his house. He would be at my house. And one of the great joys of that period of my life is I didn't know what black and white meant or what it was. I had no idea that we were any different. My grandmother, who lived out on the farm outside of town, would come to visit, and she'd see me sitting on the floor playing with this black kid, and she'd have a fit. And she was a good lady. She really was. She had a great heart, and she, she was a caring person, but she'd never been exposed to those differences. And it was awful hard for her to sort all that out. Well... Bonzi and I lost contact with each other, and when I was six, we moved out to the suburbs, to a little house out in a, a borough outside of Reading, and there were no more black people. And gradually, I understood that there was a difference. When it came to race, it was kind of like that crazy old poster they used to have of the little boy and the little girl, and they're pulling their pants out, and they're going, there is a difference. It was a kind of shock to me, too. We had one African-American girl in our high school class, just one. And um, when I was eight years old, two years after we moved, we came down here to Florida. And on the way down Route 1, we stopped in uh, St. Augustine, Florida. Dawn and I were just there to see the Christmas lights. <laughs> and while we were traveling as an eight-year-old, my dad liked to stop at these little places, and uh, we stopped at the old jail. How many of you know what the old jail in St. Augustine, right? Well, when I was eight years old, and we went to the old jail, and I know I've told you this 
a couple years ago, but I'll tell you again. I found out there is a difference. I found out about bigotry, and I found out that some folks just don't get the same benefits that we do just because we're white. And while we were at the old jail, I, I walked over to a water fountain and my dad grabbed hold of my arm and I said, what? He said, no, that one. And I looked and there was a sign above the water fountain I was headed for. It said, colored. And then I went to the one that I was going to drink from that my dad pointed me to and it said, white. And I had no idea. As a matter of fact, I might have been eight years old, but I was still dumb enough to turn around and ask my dad, is this colored water? I didn't know. And then there were bathrooms, and I had to go, and, and we had the same little conversation about, about that. So the old jail is where little Jimmy learned there is a difference. Learned about separation and segregation and, and bigotry. And then throughout my life, there have been folks that have come my way that have, have helped me cut through that and understand it a little better. And I remember in high school wearing a little pin on my collar. It was black, a black circular pin and had a white equal sign on it, part of the Urban League. And we were involved in trying to make things better for black folks in downtown Reading. And then when we got to college, we were a little different because the blacks who came to college at Messiah College, where Don and I graduated, were mostly from Africa. There weren't a lot of black students from Harrisburg or eastern Pennsylvania there. There were a few, but most of our black students were actually real African students that missionaries sent there. And once again, you, you learned this wall has to be broken down. There have been some great, great times over the years where I've run into people that have taught me that no matter what color you are, there's, there's things that are so joyous and wonderful about their life and your life and, and that moment of developing friendships that comes about that it's, it's always kind of cool, kind of neat. <clears throat> I remember that my dad used to... Uh, work in a boiler plant and he'd come home from work and sometimes we'd go fishing and we'd go fishing with African-American guys that he worked with and my dad once told me when we had this discussion about race he said that that nasty n-word that they use for black people he said don't don't ever use that I said why what does that mean and he said I'll tell you what it means he said, it's, it's a lie because he said, I work with black people and I work with white people and being that N-word has nothing to do with what color you are. Because in his mind, he knew that the black people were proud and happy to have that job and worked so hard and the white guys would come in and grab a cup of coffee and a newspaper, head for the bathroom and you wouldn't see them for two hours. And it used to really burn him up. I remember coming to Florida on a subsequent trip. I was about 12, maybe. And uh, we went to Fort Pierce where my uncle, my mom's brother-in-law, my mom's sister's husband, ran a painting business. And we went to uh, go out night fishing on the bridge down there one day. It was a, a catwalk that went along the bridge over the, over the Indian River or the Inland Waterway, whatever that is down there. And uh, we got to the bridge, and we're walking out on the bridge, and there were a whole bunch of African-American guys, maybe five or six of them sitting there on buckets, and they had cane poles, and they were throwing the line or a leader off of the bridge, and, and they'd catch a fish, and they'd pull on that cane pole, and a fish would come up out of the water and actually pop when it left the water. Up would come and land in behind them, and they'd run out and get it and put it in the bucket. 
I was just amazed at this. I watched this and watched this, and my dad and my Uncle Bill, they watched for a little while, and then they wandered down the bridge, and they kept on going, and I lost sight of them, and I stayed there with these black guys, and one of them said to me, you want to learn how to do that, boy? I said, yeah. So I sat there and got my cane pole, and they baited me up, and I sat there and fished with them, and my dad and my uncle kept on going, and then they must have come back down the other side of the bridge, forgot all about me, got in the van, and went home. (laughs) And they walked in the house, and my mom and my uh, Aunt Mary said, where's Jimmy? And I won't repeat the part of the things that came out of their mouths. But anyway, they got back in the van and came tearing back down there. This is like an hour after they left me at least, maybe more. I'm still sitting on a bucket with those black guys with my cane pole having myself a wonderful time. We had just a great time catching fish on that bridge in Fort Pierce. It's a life memory. It's like ingrained in my head. And my mother being mad at my dad for the next week, kind of stays in my mind too so (laughs) along the way I've learned that there's there is no difference just people trying to get by trying to do the best they can whether they grew up on a street or an alley that two cars couldn't pass whether their dad was a cop or drove a soda truck when he came back from the war whether they were fishing on a bridge with a cane pole or had the the nicest uh, deep sea rod to to fish with, uh, we're we're all the same trying to get by. I went to uh, the Martin Luther King breakfast out in L.A. with my son, who's a union official, and uh, got to meet Dr. James Lawson, who walked and marched with Martin Luther King in the uh, marches. He was there at, at Memphis when King was, was killed. And my son took me backstage, and I got to meet this icon, another icon of the civil rights movement. And uh, my son said to him, uh, this is my dad, Jim Keough, and he said uh, he came all the way from Florida to, uh, to hear you. Well, I didn't come to hear him. I came to see my son and do some things out in California. But uh, I, I did come from California. I did come from Florida, and, and I did want to go and, and hear Dr. Lawson. And Dr. Lawson comes up to me and gives me a big bear hug. He says, well, you win the prize for coming the furthest, he said. And he was just a, a great, great. Uh, the one thing I was most jealous of is he had this white, beautiful, curly white hair and uh, a whole head full of this. And I thought, boy. It's not, I don't know about the black and white thing, but I sure would like to have that guy's hair. <laughs> what, a, what a guy. And he spoke, he spoke, and, and he didn't have a note. And he's in his early 90s. I think he's about 95, 96 now. He didn't, he didn't use a note. He was powerful. He held everybody's attention. It was amazing. And then right after him, your, vi- your current vice president got up, and she spoke. And she had these two things in front of her with the uh, words to her speech going on uh, on the whole thing. And, uh, uh, and this isn't a political statement. This is just an uh, observation about her speaking ability. Compared to Jim Lawson, she was terrible. <laughs> she was just awful. And uh, I thought to myself, why can't we elect that guy <laughs> because <laughs> he was just phenomenal. During a trip that Martin Luther King took many, many years ago, before, obviously long before his death, to Detroit, Michigan, my old stomping grounds before I came here, he was uh, at Detroit's Second Baptist Church. The minister there at the time was Edward Simmons, and uh, he introduced King, and he told that King had been there once or twice before and that even his father had spoken there several times before. So Martin Luther King is not just some flash in the pan who happened to show up in in Memphis and Atlanta and get a little bit of national attention. He was out on on the glory road. He was out speaking on behalf not just of civil rights, but of Jesus. 
and his dad was a pastor before him, and his mother played the piano and the organ in the church, and he, he spent his life not just trying to break down the walls of, of segregation and, and bigotry, but he spent his life trying to get people to understand that the power that breaks down the walls is your personal faith. And he was a preacher, a leader in the civil rights movement, yes. And he was MLK Day, and he was Martin Luther King Jr., but he was also the Reverend Martin Luther King. And he had earned degrees, and he was extremely smart. And he also had this amazing ability to hold people's attention. He also was a father to his children and an example to them. It always amazes me that when you talk to some people about Martin Luther King who are uh, three shades shy of being a full-blown bigot, they'll always bring out the fact that Martin Luther King was rumored to have been unfaithful to his wife or that he did this or that wrong or that he had uh, leanings or associations with different people, none of which is really proven But boy, if we are a bigot, we want to believe it, so we'll broadcast it to somebody else and we'll tell the tale down the road. Why is it that we can't understand that nobody's perfect? I don't really care what Martin Luther King's mistakes were any more than I care what Moses' mistakes were or uh, Isaiah's mistakes were or Daniel's mistakes were, or Joseph's mistakes were, or Peter's, or Paul's, or John's. None of them was perfect. Read your Bible. There's only been one perfect guy according to the Christian faith, and you know what they did to him. So maybe it doesn't even pay to be perfect, if you could be. And Martin Luther King was not perfect. But he, like all those biblical characters I just mentioned, he was called, empowered, enabled, anointed for a purpose. And he took that purpose all the way till somebody put a bullet in him on a balcony of a junky looking motel in Memphis. And the world was was robbed. And then afterwards, the world, is, the world is still being robbed because we look for the flaws, look for the problems. You know, it's like I used to do when my five daughters would bring home guys that they were dating. <laughs> Speaking of flawed individuals, none of them was worthy. You know how, if you had daughters, you know how that goes. Well, Martin Luther King had flaws. Martin Luther King did not do everything right. But Martin Luther King deserves to be honored because he rose up and he accepted a challenge and he accepted what God called him to do, even though it caused him to be maligned and hated and his reputation to be besmirched at every turn and eventually to be in the sights of some lunatic named James Earl Ray and gunned down in the prime of his life. Never got to watch his children grow, never got to see his work fulfilled. We should honor him. And some might not like that. Frankly, Scarlet. I titled this little diatribe for you this morning. Stop, start again. If you go back and you look at your attitudes and how they were about race and about justice and about equality and about the need to break down the walls and about the need to provide opportunity, you go back to your beginning attitudes, you know you're going to stop. Think it all over again and then start again. And America needs to start again. We don't need to get rid of the police departments and we don't need to, you know, 
break down all the laws and uh, just let people run helter-skelter and uh, not have any rules and some of the crazy stuff that goes on and, and thinking that there is. But we need to do this as Martin Luther King would do it. We need to do it with love. You heard Abraham, Martin, and John. Well, John Kennedy would not agree with the thinking of a lot of people today. Ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And many of the things that Kennedy said and the quotes that come to us from John Kennedy would curl a liberal's hair today. And the same thing with Dr. King. He was not for throwing out the church or walking away from faith. He based what he taught and he based what he preached and he based his speeches on his background as a pastor and as a preacher of the word of God. And he taught us to love children. He taught us to go after authority, but to do it with kindness and peace. He looked at Gandhi as a mentor and an example. He would not agree with storming government buildings. He would not agree with... uh, causing violence and and hurt upon businesses. But he would not have us give up the fight. He would not have us stop. He would not have us give up proclaiming the need to bring about justice for everyone. Sometimes I think that we are destroying our own culture destroying ourselves from the inside. We have an opportunity. This amazing ability to broadcast and to get the word out and to put out through Facebook and other things uh, a message of love and reconciliation and peace ought to be used. In this community, we have done some amazing things. Love, Inc. has uh, done some great things for people of every color and background and religion, and we're a part of that. The Martin Luther King Scholarship Fund, which Billy talked about singing at the breakfast, has done amazing things, and our church has been able to do a little bit by providing a scholarship for a student. Now we've done that for I think this is the third year, the third year we're doing it. We should not stop. This is not a place where we come together and, and make ourselves feel good and uh, try to find the perfect church that agrees with everything we already think. You ever notice that? People jump from one church to another church to another church and they're looking for the pastor who tells them what they already think. And if he doesn't tell them what they think, they go somewhere else to find a guy that does. What is that? It's good to be challenged. It's good to learn new things. It's good to find out their colored water fountains and white ones. It's good to know that uh, not everybody lives like you live. It's good to know there are poor little children who are just precious and beautiful and sweet and innocent and have all kinds of potential, and you can do just a little bit and you'll help them. It's good to learn those things. That's what this dear man that we honor today tried to get us to do. He lost his life for it. What are we willing to do to make it happen? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God of all people. You created Adam and Eve, and throughout the eons of time, every color, every thought, every person, still has your fingerprint on them. You love every little child, red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in your sight. Help us to love. Help us to bring peace. Help us to stand up and fight for what is right. Help us to be your vessels and your voice, as Martin Luther King was your voice in his era and his time, to bring about harmony and love for all. But we pray these things in his name and for his sake. 
Jesus, the Jewish carpenter. We pray, amen. I think there are words to this. Oh, good, we have words. We have words. Let's sing. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. And they'll know we are Christians by our love. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. We will walk with each other. We will walk hand in hand. And together we'll spread the news that God is in our land. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Thanks, thanks as always.